Assalamu alaikum dear students. I'm sure you are fine. Today, let's talk about uh, words. And the topic of today's lecture, I have uh, said the same way, all about words. What are words, actually, if I, if I ask you this question? Well, words, of course, you know, I know, you know, words are, of course, our ideas. They are made of uh, alphabet, you know, and uh, they convey ideas. Some words are pictures, some words are functions. I mean to say some words uh, give us uh, pictures as meanings and some words give us, you know, uh, functions as meanings. And when these, you know, pictures and functions, you know, we put together, of course, we uh, move towards complete ideas. If words are ideas, then uh, these pictures and functions put together, I mean to say, combining these words and making a sentence, of course, we move towards complete ideas. What words are made of, actually? If I ask you rather, let me put it this way, uh, do you think um, word, I mean, is the smallest unit? Most of uh, us, you know, of course, uh, call it abruptly, yes, word is the smallest, you know, unit in any language. But I would say, of course, word is not the smallest, you know, unit. There are some more units, you know, which are smaller than, of course, words. If, you, if I, like, you know, give you, you know, view of uh, language uh, chain, which we call as linguistic rank scale, uh, this is something, you know, I'll again and again refer to in my, in my you know, coming lectures. Linguistic rank scale means, you know, um, moving from the smallest points towards, you know, uh, discourse uh, writing. For example, starting from alphabet, let's say. We, you know, combine alphabet and, uh, you know, we uh, form, uh, of course, let's say, words, okay? We combine words and then we uh, make sentences. If we, you know, go step by step, keeping in mind the linguistic rank scale, then the story starts this way that Alphabet, which we call generally, they are basically graphemes, the writing system. We combine these graphemes and we make morphemes. Now, morpheme is something which is the smallest unit of, let's say, English language. Now, if you ask me what is morpheme, I'll not tell you right now. Of course, later I'll explain you the meanings of morpheme. Combining morpheme means, you know, of course, we get words, which we call as lexes also, and... Uh, Combining these lexes, we move towards phrases, and then when we combine phrases, you know, of course, we produce clauses. And the combination of clauses, of course, uh, results in uh, sentence making, and then sentence, when you combine, of course, then you move towards paragraphing, and then, you know, text and discourse, and, you know, the story goes on. So this is all about your linguistic rank scale. So word is, of course, not, not the smallest unit. I mean to say, look, if the word is, uh, let's say, boys, the plural form of boy. Now, boy is, of course, it's one word, but this is not the smallest unit. You know why boys in itself? We have two, you know, features. One, the word boy. Second, it's plural uh, marker, which is the inclusion of s with it. So, boy plus s. It means there are, excuse me, I said boy. Uh, I, I said word. Word is a combination, actually, of morphemes. So it means if boy is one word and plural marker is something more, so these two are actually morphemes. We combine these morphemes and we make, you know, of course, words. Let me give you, you know, another uh, sentence and uh, then, of course, we'll study, you know, what are different morphemes, you know, working and how these morphemes, you know, get together to make words. By the way, the study of the structure of words actually is called morphology. Now, this is from... You know, like a word is composed of morphemes, and the study of morphemes is actually morphology. So indirectly we can say the study of the structure of words actually is called morphology. Now, the sentence which I want to, you know, give you for analysis is the plogs glopped bliply. Now, this is a sentence composed of three or cons consisting of three, you know, uh, words. The plogs glopped Bliply. Now, let me ask you some questions. How many are the plogs? Is it one or more than one? Of course, you will analyze it that this uh, plogs uh, has got with itself 
uh, a plural marker, which is S. So it cannot be just one. It means just more than one. Okay, fine. Second one, what this, uh, these plogs are doing, of course, they are, you know, glopping. Now, are they glopping now or they were doing it in the past or towards the future? Let's analyze the second word. Glop is in it, its past form. Y, G, L, O, R, P, plus E, D is a past marker, verb past marker. So this uh, glop is not now, this is in the past. The third one is bliply. Now what is bliply? Bliply actually here is uh, working as an adverb. Why adverb? Because there is an adverb marker with it, L-Y. It's not blip, it's what? It's bliply. L-Y is an adverb, you know, marker. So analyzing this sentence, in this sentence we come to know that uh, plogs is not one word. I mean to say is not the smallest unit. It's composed of actually two morphemes. One as plog and the second morpheme is the plural marker S. So these are two morphemes. Exactly the same way, globed also is not the smallest unit in this sentence. It also consists of uh, two morphemes. Number one, glop as a word, one morpheme. And second one, of course, is the, its past marker, ed. And also the same way, bliply is also composed of two morphemes. One is blip and second, it's, you know, adverb marker, ly, bliply. So in this sentence, we found six morphemes, three words and six morphemes. Now these morphemes actually are the smallest units of language. And of course, keep in mind, these morphemes are also composed of graphemes, which are what? Right, I mean, alphabet, you can call them, symbols, you can call them, writing symbols, you can call them, you know. They are like the way in other languages, you know, let's say in Urdu, you have Alif Bay, and in English, you know, you have like ABC, these are graphemes. Now, from this, we understand that morphemes, I used, you know, two types of, you know, words for them. One as word, second as, you know, or you can say root word and second as marker. Like uh, when I gave you the example of boys, boy was a root word and its uh, plural marker was S. Now, if I ask you this question, out of these two morphemes, which one, which morpheme can stand alone? Boy can stand alone or S can stand alone? Of course, your answer is boy can stand alone. S is nothing. Unless and until it's put with boys, then of course it will convey meanings. Without boy, S will be taken as a grapheme, not as a morpheme. But when we break our word boys into two, there it will be of course named as boy one morpheme, S second morpheme, why it was the part of boy as a plural marker. If I delete boy and keep only S as there, then S of course will... Uh, you know, will, uh, cannot qualify in its uh, own self as morpheme. It will rather go down to its grapheme level. Okay, so boy can stand alone, S cannot stand alone. Exactly the same way the sentence, you know, which we analyzed together, the plogs glopped bliply. Now, in this, there are uh, two types of morphemes. We call it free morpheme and we call it bound morpheme. Now, free morphemes are, you know, which can stand alone. You can say root words, all root words of English language, you know. They can stand, of course, alone. They are free morphemes. Now, morphemes, you know, which uh, change, you know, or help us changing our words into past, let's say. Help us changing our words, let's say, into plural. Help us changing our words, let's say, into adverb, you know. Like, for plural, you add S or ES. For past, let's say, you add ED. For uh, adverb, you know, let's say you add ly. Now, this s or ed or ly, you know, they cannot stand alone. When they cannot stand alone, we call them bound morphemes. Means they exist with the free morphemes uh, to bring about certain changes. Otherwise, if the free morphs, morphemes, you know, we delete, then their existence, of course, will be a question. So, what we are studying, actually, the structure of words. And I told you that words are composed of morphemes. 
And the study of the structure of words is called morphology. We have two types of morphemes, free morphemes and bound morphemes. Free morphemes are which can stand alone. Bound morphemes are which cannot stand alone. Example I gave you, boys. If you uh, split boys into two morphemes, boy and s, boy is a free morpheme because it can stand alone. S is a bound morpheme, it cannot stand alone. Another important thing, free morphemes, morphemes of course will give you, even if you, uh, you know, break the word down into its smaller parts, smaller units, which actually we call morphemes, free morphemes, you know, still will be having, you know, meanings in them, whereas, you know, bound morphemes, of course, cannot convey meanings unless they are put with the free morphemes. So this is about, you know, the structure of words. One more example before I, you know, move ahead. Let's say a uh, child is, uh, you know, one word and it has uh, one morpheme in it. We can uh, combine child and make its plural, for example, like children, for example, or let's say childish, for example. Now, childish is uh, composed of two morphemes. One is child and then I-S-H, you know, this is a second morpheme put together and the word is, you know, a uh, uh, word composed of two morphemes. We can change the same word into three morphemes also. For example, childishly. Now, in this sentence, in this word, now, child is one morpheme. I-S-H, which made the word childish, is the second morpheme. L-Y is the third morpheme. Now, this, if I give you the analysis of this word childishly, or child, uh, childishness, for example, is the same thing, child, and then uh, ish, and then ness. Now, these three morphemes, first one is the free morpheme, and the other two are bound morphemes. If uh, the uh, example is, you know, childishness, child is a free morpheme, it can stand alone, it conveys, even if it, even if it, you know, stands, stands alone, it conveys full-fledged meanings, but, uh, Ish, I-S-H, when separated from the free morpheme, of course, it cannot convey any meanings. And Ness also, when separated from its free morpheme, does not convey any meanings. So, words can uh, be composed of uh, one morpheme, two morphemes, three morphemes, and in English language, six is about it. I mean, we can have uh, words uh, composed of maximum six morphemes. I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, that's the finality. I mean, we cannot have words more than six morphemes. What I'm trying to say is, I mean, uh, the way uh, we say sentences should be of some uh, control length, paragraphs should be of some control length, exactly the same way. Words should also be of some control length. I mean, Smaller words, you know, are always desirable for the writers, you know. The good friends are, of course, words which are smaller in size, which we say short and familiar, you know, words. We are going to prefer these words over, uh, you know, words which are longer in size, you know. Of course, they will be confusing their readers. So, words which are consisting of uh, less number of morphemes, of course, will be, you know, our choice. If I give you, as I said, like, you know, the six morphemes is about it in English language, the word goes as disestablishmentarianism. Uh, now, this word, disestablishmentarianism, if, if you analyze this, you know, word, it uh, has, you know, six morphemes, like the first one, this, this is one morpheme, establish is second uh, morpheme, and meant, dis, establish, meant, no, three morphemes. Then, Aryan, dis, establish, mentarian, and last one is ism. In total are these five. If you add one more as a, as a, uh, as a, as, as a prefix, let's say nt, so the word goes as nt, dis, establish, mentarianism. So, a word can have six morphemes also. But make sure when you construct your words, make sure that uh, comprehension of your reader 
of course, will be a question. Therefore, uh, words which are smaller in size, of course, should be everybody's choice. Now, the next item I would like to discuss uh, with you about words is that how words are formed, actually. How words are, from one word, you know, we can uh, make so many words. Of course, there are five ways, you know, we form words. Number one, the word forms. When I say word forms, it means, let's say there's a noun, you can change noun into adjective. And then if, it's a, if there is a, let's say, adjective, you can change it into adverb. And there can be a verb also of the same, wor same word. So this is how, like, from one, you know, word, we make, uh, you know, two, three, four, you know, words. This is called, you know, changing the word form. Second one is portmanteau words. When I say portmanteau words, this is something very interesting uh, in, in, in the sense that uh, in portmanteau words, we, uh, we derive words by combining portions of more than one words. Let's say Oxford and uh, Cambridge. Uh, you can uh, take one portion of Oxford, you can take one portion of Cambridge, you know, and you can combine these and uh, make a new word, and that will be called as a portmanteau word. Details, of course, I'll give you later on. The third method is prefixes. Prefixes means words which you can uh, put at the start of words and, uh, you know, you can construct uh, further words. And then exactly the same way there are suffixes. Suffixes means the same way group of alphabets, you know, you can put in the end of the words and you can make more words. And the last one is compounding. Compounding means, you know, two words put together and, you know, making a new item. So this is all. These are five ways of, like, word formation. Let's discuss these, you know, one by one. First, of course, will be word forms. As I told you before, when I say word forms, please keep in mind, in our uh, upcoming lectures, of course, we'll be talking about parts of speech. Just to give you an idea, when I say parts of speech, of course, these are the same things like uh, conjunctions and prepositions and articles and nouns and pronouns and blah, blah, blah. These are like, you know, eight uh, different uh, parts of speech. Uh, out of these eight parts of speech, you know, four are picture words, which I just counted for you, like nouns and adjectives, verbs and adverbs. Now, these four picture words, picture words are actually major items in your sentence, which carry major meanings. And the remaining things, you know, like, you know, conjunctions and uh, articles and prepositions and pronouns, you know, they are not picture words, actually. And they do not contain in themselves the major ideas, actually. They contain in themselves, you know, some minor ideas, actually. Or you can say, you know, these uh, words facilitate the picture words, I mean, and help them, like, you know, uh, to convey uh, full-fledged meanings. So when I say word formation, and inside the word formation, when I'm saying word forms, Actually, I mean word forms means these picture words, which are four, nouns and uh, adjectives, ad verbs and adverbs. Take a word, let's say decide. Now, to decide is a verb, and we can change this verb into its noun also, decision. Decision is a noun, and we can construct an adjective also, let's say decisive. And if someone is decisive, we can make its antonym also, let's say indecisive. Now, from one word, I created how many? Three more. Beside as a verb, decision as a noun, decisive as, a, as an adjective, indecisive as another adjective. Of course, both these are antonyms. And uh, you can add ly to these adjectives and can design adverbs also, like decisively or indecisively. But from one, how many? Five words, you know, we created. This is called, you know, word forms and word formation. Okay, let's take a look of some more examples for our concept to be clear. On your screen, you can see the key word is beauty, second one is pay, and third one is receive. Let's uh, change these uh, three words into the further, you know, forms. From beauty, you can change it into beautiful, then uh, beautician, and beautify. Now, beautiful, of course, is an adjective. Beautician is a noun. And beautify is, of course, its verb. And beauty is, again, in itself a noun. And second example, pay. Pay is a noun also. Pay is a verb also. And then payment is, again, noun. Payable, this is an adjective. And then pay, again, noun. 
to whom actually you pay. Next example is receive. From receive, you, uh, you can make receptionist, you can make receipt, you can make receptive. So, more example, describe. From describe, you can go into, uh, let's say, of course, describe is a verb. You can change it into noun, description, then uh, uh, descriptive, and uh, indescribable. Then comes sense. From sense, sensation. Insensitive, senseless. From explain to inexplicable or explanation. And then comes prophecy. You can change prophecy into prophet and prophesy. From famous, you can change it into fame, infamous, infamy. And from enthusiasm, you can change it into enthusiastically, enthusiast, and enthuse. Now, here, enthuse, of course, is your, you know, verb from enthusiasm. So, this is how we can make, you know, words from the forms. Don't forget uh, this very fact that uh, not all words, you know, can have the very four forms. Uh, I mean to say, some verbs may not have the nouns or may not have the adjectives. In the same way, some uh, nouns may not have, you know, their verbs. So, all the four forms are not possible for every word. But still, you know, many uh, words are there which can have most number of forms. I mean, uh, the same uh, noun into adjective, you know, verb into, you know, of course, uh, adverbs. Let's now move towards our now portmanteau words, which I told you before. Portmanteau word, how we construct these. We combine portions of, uh, you know, two or more than two words together, and we can make, you know, portmanteau. As I told you uh, that if, uh, let's say, two words are Oxford and Cambridge, you combine these two and you make a word which we call as uh, Oxbridge. Now, if you see from Oxford, we took ox, O-X, and from Cambridge, let's say we took uh, bridge, ox and bridge, we combined, and another, you know, word uh, we designed, which is Oxbridge. In the same way, because is a very commonly used word. If you see, because is also a portmanteau word. It is, uh, I mean, the portions, you know, have been taken from by and cause. From uh, by, we took, let's say, the burr, you know, sound thing, and uh, the cause, you know, factor together, and because, you know, word we uh, formed. Another important, you know, brunch. Brunch is also a portmanteau word. How it is uh, formed, it's a combination of breakfast and lunch. You know, take one portion from breakfast, another portion from lunch, combine these two together, and the word is, you know, brunch. Of course, brunch is a meal which you take, between your breakfast and your, what you call, uh, lunch thing. There are five meals, three are main course, two are like, uh, I mean, light meals you can take, five o'clock tea and, and, you know, uh, this brunch thing. So this is that, you know, stuff I'm talking about. Some more examples uh, for your interest on the screen, you can take a look. Camcorder, you know, which we very commonly use, you know, these days as we, like, you know, go buying gadgets. So camcorder is a combination of camera and recorder. Please do not forget, when I'm saying uh, portmanteau words, unlike compounding, look, you can compare portmanteau words with compounding, I mean compound words. In compound words, we combine full-fledged words actually to form new words. In portmanteau, we do not take full-fledged words to combine. Please do not forget this. Portions, actually. If you combine, uh, you know, uh, full-fledged words, then they will not be portmanteau. They will be compound words. So, in portmanteau portions, like uh, the word I'm sharing with you is camcorder. So, from camera, we took cam, and from recorder, we took corder only. So, camcorder, we combined, and another, another, like, you know, gadget you named. Another example, email. Very simple. Electronic and uh, mail, you know, we, we, we took portions from and, you know, combined and uh, made uh, another portmanteau as email. Same with fortnight. I mean, this is something very interesting. Fortnight, which you call it, you know, 15 days, let's say two weeks, in other words, you know. Now, fortnight is uh, 40 and nights. These were two words, actually. This is fort we took from 40 and nights. We combined these and portmanteau, 40 nights. And then comes, you know, hassle. Hassle is a combination of haggle and tussle. Then intercom. 
Intercom is another interesting in a portmanteau word. It's a combination of internal and communication. From uh, internal, we took inter. From communication, we took com only and intercom. Internal communication, actually, you know, we combine these. Next comes internet. Now, internet is a combination of portions taken from international and network. International network, two portions we took and we designed internet. Then comes motel, another interesting in a portmanteau word. Motel is a combination of motor and hotel. From motor you took mo and from hotel you took tell and motel. Another like in a word is the, of course, roadside uh, hotels are where you can spend your night and, you know, um, you can take the next morning breakfast and then, you know, you can again go back uh, either to your home or you can like, you know, go ahead. Next one is netty. Cat. Another, it's, it's a very new word, netiquette. The way, like, you know, we had a word etiquette. I mean, some uh, study of uh, mannerism thing, etiquette, social manners and all. Now we have netiquette also, like, you know, there should be some manners, you know, to be observed once you are online, because online is also now a community considered these days, online community. So there, you know, has to be some manners to follow once you are online. So netiquette actually is taken from internet and etiquette. Combine these, the portions, and portmanteau words are there. Then a sitcom. Ask people, I mean, uh, what they enjoy watching on TV, they would say, like, you know, of course, we enjoy sitcom. Now, sitcom is actually a combination of, of course, portions taken from situation and comedy. These were two words, situation and comedy. Portions you took and you made another word, sitcom. By the way, these are also these words which I'm discussing with you, portmanteau words, they can also be called as derivatives because, you know, we are deriving words from, you know, already existing other units. We are combining. Okay, that's another thing, you know, we are not combining full-fledged. We are like, you know, simply borrowing, you know, what you call uh, the portions from. But, of course, you are deriving. So, these words can also be called as derivatives. Another important, very, very important word, smog. Now, smog is the combination of smoke and fog. And then it's telegenic. Of course, you must have heard of the word photogenic, like he's a photogenic. Uh, and exactly the same way, telegenic. The telegenic is the combination of television and uh, photogenic. Photogenic and television we combined, and telegenic word we created, which is the third one, you know. Next comes telex. Telex means teleprinter and exchange. And last one, portmanteau word, workaholic. Workaholic means, of course, the one who is very, very hard working. Now, this word is from the combination of work and addict. That, you know, you are addicted to work now. You, um, you rather get tired, you know, when you sit idle. Once you are, like, you know, busy doing things, you never feel as that, you know, you are tired. So, workaholic people are, like, you know, these. So, it's the combination of uh, work and addict. Now, we have seen so far... Two ways of uh, word forming. Number one was changing word forms. And the second one is portmanteau, borrowing uh, portions from words, combining them, and creating new words. Now, two more, which, which we call as prefixes and suffixes. Now, what are prefixes and suffixes? Look, prefix is uh, not, of course, a word. You can say it's a group of alphabet. You can put this group of alphabet at the start of a word and you can create a new one. Let's say possible is one word. Now, from this possible, you can uh, add I am M plus possible. Now, uh, since I'm putting I am at the start of the word, it's called prefix. If I add something at the end of the word, it will be called as suffix. So please do not forget, prefix means I'm adding at the start of a word. And suffix, I'm adding at the end of a word, okay? Like uh, when we make, uh, you know, let's say adverbs from adjectives, right? So there we add ly. We do not add ly at the start of the word. We add ly at the end of the word. So they are called suffix, not prefix. So the word which, like, you know, we are studying, possible, I added group of alphabet, I am, these two uh, alphabet I added at the start of the word possible, and the word is impossible. Now, this is uh, another word, I would say rather uh, opposite meanings, you know, conveying from possible going to impossible. So, this is how, like, you know, 
uh, we make new words by adding words. At the start of the, you can say, root words, word formation is there. Another example, let's say pseudo-intellectual. Now, pseudo actually is a you know, group of alphabet which we, which we call uh, something which is false. So when I say pseudo-intellectual, it means, of course, someone who is not intellectual or someone pretends to be intellectual, but actually he's not. So pseudo, pseudo I added at the start. If when I added at the start, it became, you know, of course, prefix. Another example, let's say bishop is one word. If I uh, add, you know, let's say arch at the start, archbishop, so it will be, of course, another, you know, new word. Let's say function, and I add one, uh, you know, uh, prefix, mal function, another new word. Of course, it will be opposite to what actually I talked about function. Malfunction, of course, something, you know, which is not function, which is not functioning properly. Then is another prefix. Let's say the word is classical, and I say neoclassical. Now, neoclassical, of course, means, you know, a mix of old traditions and modern, you know, norms. So mix of these, neoclassical. Another one you can say hypercritical. Hypercritical. Critical actually is a root word. Hyper is a prefix. Prefix plus root word critical. Another word hypercritical. Active you can take a word. It's a root word. You can add a prefix. Let's say hyperactive. So it would be like um, a very new word. So this is how. That's the function of you know prefixes. Prefixes, you know, you can add at the start of, uh, you know, words and you can create altogether new, you know, words. It's, it, it, it's a different issue whether you create uh, synonyms or antonyms. I mean to say, you the words which you are making, uh, do they carry, uh, again, the same meanings or the meanings change? That's a different issue. We have seen that, you know, some words, of course, they were, they were like, uh, were, you know, giving after being uh, recreated, you know, they were giving uh, quite opposite meaning. So that's no question, actually. That's no debate whether the meanings change or they do not change. Of course, when we are creating new words from, definitely meanings are going to change. Next comes, you know, suffix, suffixes. I already explained you suffixes are group of alphabets, you know, which we put at the end of words and we create meanings, new words. Some examples, you know, I have uh, jotted down on your screen. You can take a look. Like the first word, except. Except is a root word, and uh, able I, you know, added at the end of the word, so it became as acceptable. Another word is notice, from notice to noticeable, and another example is from convert to convertible. Then another key word is short, and age is suffix. Keyword plus A-G-E put together shortage or storage. Then is uh, wisdom. Then is kingdom. So in either, in both of these cases, D-O-M is the suffix and new words are there. Then capable, from capable to capability. So I-T-Y and in the words flexibility, again, I-T-Y will be, of course, a suffix and, you know, new words are there. From word as a keyword, you can add one suffix, en, it will be wooden, you know. And bright, let's say, is a keyword and a root word. You can add en with it and it will become, of course, verb, brighten. Bright is an adjective, you know, and you can add en with it. Now, en, since you are adding at the end of the word, it is called suffix and it will be, of course, a verb. Then quickly, as I mentioned to you before, that adverbs are also suffixes. I mean to say, we add ly in most of the adverbs. You know, we add ly. Adding ly at the end of the, you know, word means creating, making, forming words by adding suffixes. So from quick, it will be quickly. So this is, you know, our uh, fourth type or of, uh, you know, word formation. The last one, which I told you, is compounding. Unlike portmanteau words, Compounding, we, you know, combine full-fledged words, actually, and we create, you know, new uh, words. For example, from news, uh, you can add one more. News is one word. Stand is another word. You can put these two together. News stand. Let's say news clip. 
let's say newspaper. When I say newspaper, it's a combination of, you can say compound of two words. One is news, second is a paper. Now, these two are, I mean, of course, different words. But full-fledged words we are combining and creating, you know, uh, the third word, which uh, we call as compound word. Here, we cannot use, you know, derivation actually, derivatives. Portmanteau, of course, can be derivatives. But these are, this is called compounding. These are compound words because we are combining full-fledged words. Some more example, from flower, you can uh, add petal, flower and petal put together. You know, it's a compound word, flower petal or flower pot or flower bed or flower bud also. Then uh, from lady, from lady, you can add bug with it, ladybug, lady finger, lady purse. Now, these were, of course, different words compounded together and created, of course, you know, new words. Then comes eye, eye color, eyebrow, and eyelid. From hand, you can add uh, one, uh, another, you know, word, bag, handbag, shake, handshake, glove, hand glove. Please keep one more important thing in mind. When you combine, you know, words, or in compounding, it does not matter that, uh, uh, you know, we either hyphenate our words. Hyphenate means two words put together, but still divided by a small dash hyphen. Okay? Or fused together. Put these two words together, no hyphen, no space in them, put together, fused into each other. Or third one is, you know, just put together, not fused into each other and no hyphen. Like in the case of hand glove, hand glove we cannot put, I mean, we cannot, you know, fused into each other like H-A-N-D and right after, you know, G-L-O-V-E. Of course, they would will, will be written, you know, of course, separately, but still will be called one word because it's a compound word. This is how, you know, we make, uh, you know, our words. So far, we have talked about uh, morphemes and the word structures. Second, we talked about how words are formed and four methods, uh, five actually methods I shared with you. The first method is word forms. Second method is portmanteau words, combining the portions of words and creating new, then uh, prefixes and suffixes and compounding. These are five, you know, methods of uh, combining or creating or forming words. Now, moving towards our uh, third aspect of, you know, all about words, that is figurative language. I mean, words can uh, give you literal meanings and figurative meanings both. Now, when I say literal meanings, literal meanings means, you know, basic dictionary meanings. You have a word, I mean, you go to dictionary, you check its uh, primary meanings, that we call as, you know, literal meanings, literal semantics. Words can also be used for some special meanings. For example, let's say knife is one word and uh, I can uh, describe the attributes of knife. Let's say it's sharp, the quality of sharp knife. But sometimes you must have heard of it, you know. We use sharp for tongue also. That he's a sharp tongue means he is very, very abrupt, harsh in his manners. He does not... Uh, you know, think before he talks. He does not take care who he is talking with or talking to. So he's sharp tongue. Now, look here. It's understood that knife is sharp. You can see it. You can, you know, uh, give this, uh, you know, uh, quality. To, you can assign this quality to something which you can see. And it's understood also that your knife is sharp. It can cut like anything. But tongue sharp. What actually we do? This is what actually we call special meanings, figurative use of language or figurative language. What actually we do? We borrow qualities and attributes of certain things and we use them for some special purposes. Like the sharpness of knife is of course a quality, is an attribute. We borrowed it and we used it for someone's tongue as being harsh, sharp, not taking care, inconsiderate. 
someone discourteous, impolite, very abrupt in his manner. So this is all like, you know, literal and figurative. So be very careful when you, uh, I mean, uh, are into readings, for example. You have to ask yourself whether the writer is uh, using language literally or figuratively. He may have some special meanings, but when you look, uh, I mean, you know, you look up those words uh, from the dictionary over there, like, you know, you might be confused, you know, in understanding that, you know, look, the meanings over in the dictionary tells, let's say, A, B, C, and the writer over there uh, in context uh, means something else. So there, of course, he is trying to use things figuratively. Some more examples for the concept. Let's say, second example, T is sweet and sweet baby. Look, T can be sweet, understandable. Now, the quality attributes of the T being sweet we use for the babies that, uh, to express that someone is very cute, huh? someone is so loving, right? Someone is so angelic. So, the attributes of one thing when we borrow and use for something else is called, you know, figurative language, special meanings we say. So, sweet baby. I mean, baby is not sweet the way tea is sweet or any like, you know, any, any, any like uh, sweets which we eat, you know, of course not that case. One more example, yacht sailed gracefully. Now, when we say sailing, of course, like, uh, you know, ocean comes in mind, rivers, you know, come in mind. Yacht sailed gracefully and he sailed through his exam. Now, yacht sailed, you now sailing, of course, means, you know, journey, fine, uh, uh, what you call uh, rivers and, you know, oceans and seas and all. Okay, the, that's the register of like, you know, sail. But when we say he sailed through his exam, so same way, sailing through exam means, you know, he very smoothly passed through his exams, so special meanings. One more, brush your hair and brush up your English. Now, brush your hair, very simple thing. Have a brush, have a comb, and brush your hair. Literal meanings. But when I say brush up your English, it does not mean, you know, that uh, English is something that you can uh, brush uh, it the way you brush your hair. Of course not. You brush your hair to get a good look exactly the same way when you say brush up your English, exactly the same way, like maybe revise your English to give it a good look or set it the way it should be. Next one, swollen jaw and swollen head. It's understood that, you know, swollen jaw, some problem, you know, in your oral cavity, some problem with your teeth, some problems with your gum, you know, that you have a swollen jaw, but swollen head, does. I mean, it's something, I mean, we don't understand. Why we don't understand? Because here writer uses it figuratively. Swollen jaw means, you know, that something which has... Uh, increased in size, but swollen head actually means that uh, someone who is uh, arrogant, why maybe that uh, someone, uh, you know, um, got some victory, for example, and, uh, and now he is a uh, swollen head, you know, he is, you know, um, he's so showy that, you know, he has won something. So, swollen head actually is termed as, you know, someone who is arrogant in his behavior. Another one, you know, calm hair and calm the jungle. Now, calming hair, again, like the way we were brushing our hair, calming hair and calming jungle. You cannot calm the jungle, right? So, calming jungle actually means that you are uh, searching somebody, okay? So, calming jungle is a figurative uh, language. Some more example, diamonds are expensive and he is a rough diamond. Now, Diamond, fine, uh, we understand literal meanings, but can someone be a diamond also? When we say someone is a diamond, let's say, it means, you know, someone is, uh, you know, uh, let's say, uh, rare in his attributes, you know, someone is rare in his qualities and his capacities and his, uh, you know, skills, let's say, his qualifications, for example. Or someone is, you know, fruitful or someone uh, is... Uh, you know, um, so helping and, you know, so kind and, you know, so considerate. So, we, you can call people diamond. If you call someone rough diamond, of course, someone is a rough diamond means, you know, someone has skills, but they need polishing, for example. Then, you know, uh, boat sank and heart sank. Sinking of boat is literal language, 
But heart, sinking of heart, can heart also sink? Of course, bad feelings, the sinking feelings. When you are depressed, you are upset, you know, your heart sinks the way, you know, Titanic sank. So, uh, heart at some times, you know, they do sink. Drop an idea. This is another interesting example. You can, uh, when you say drop an idea, leaving an idea, the way you drop things, okay? So, leaving an idea. Glaring error. Glaring means, you know, obvious error. So, from the glare, you took the attributes and you, you know, gave it to uh, errors, glaring errors, errors which are quite obvious. And I plowed my way through the mathematics problems. I mean, of course, you resolved your mathematics, you know, problems. Of course, we plow in the fields, actually. Farmers plow in the fields. So, this is how, you know, you do it. This is called literal and figurative language. Then we, at times, use similes also. This is, of course, very much part and parcel of figurative language. Similes means, you know, when uh, uh, you start comparing uh, things, like as sharp as, as cute as, as bright as, as hard as. So this as and as use is, you know, of course, simile factor, where like, you know, you compare, compare the whiteness of object A and compare the whiteness of something and you compare these two uh, to convey meanings. This is all about figurative and, you know, literal language. Literal language, please do not forget, is the uh, uh, language in which writer uses the basic meanings of words. And figurative language is where writers use some special meanings. And it's reader's job, actually, to understand the difference between literal and figurative. Let's you now move towards another aspect of words, collocations. What are collocations? Collocations are words which uh, are in uh, very natural associations. I mean that, let's say, uh, water is one word. And uh, if I talk about its behavior, of course, its behavior is water can be hot or cold. No, water's hot or water's cold. Hot and cold are the collocations of water. Now, if I want to say that something is very hot or something is very cold, so how to say? Of course, I can use a stress marker very, but no, there are some specialized collocations, which I, uh, as I said, collocations are words which normally go together. If you see the definition of collocation means things which are put together side by side. So words which naturally, naturally go, you know, with each other. As I said, hot water or cold water. If you want to add the stress marker, as I said, very hot water or very cold water, we have some specialized collocations. For example, let's say pipping hot. Now, pipping hot, pipping is actually the collocation of hot means very hot. Icy cold. Now, icy is the collocation of, you know, cold. And then cold is the collocation of water. So, icy, cold, water. That's the function of collocations. Some more collocations for your interest on the screen. Like cheap is a word. And if you want to say very cheap, you can say dirt cheap instead of saying it very cheap. No, dirt as dirt is cheap. Dirt cheap. Another example, deaf. And if you want to say he is, uh, I mean, you want to add stress factor, very factor with it. If you say he's very deaf, does not make any sense. But if you say stone deaf, he's deaf the way stones are. Yes, stone deaf. Stone is the collocation of deaf. Then new. You want to say it's very new. So brand. You will add brand. And brand is a collocation of new, brand new. Then called dark. Pitch. Dark. Pitch is the collocation. And then comes uh, mind. Sharp mind. Clear. Crystal. Clear. Thin. Paper. Thin. Thin as paper. Paper. Thin. So these are collocations actually. Cold. As I told you before, I see cold. Bottom is the rock bottom. One example, like, you know, arguments, for example. Argument is a word, and there are different collocations. Let's say you can, uh, you, can uh, you know, make an argument. So, making is an argument. You can, uh, uh, you know, endorse an argument. If you want to go with the argument, you can say, I endorse this argument. So, endorse is a collocation of argument. Or you can, you can go the other way. Refute. You know, refute will also be a collocation of argument. 
So endorse and refute are two collocations for argument. It's very, very important to understand and learn collocations of words because they increase your vocabulary and they make you very appropriate. There are dictionaries available in the market, you know, which we call as Oxford Dictionary of Collocations. You can buy that and see, like, you know, what are the natural associations of words. Our uh, next item is denotation and connotation. Now, denotation and connotation means what? Denotations, again, like I, when I was uh, comparing uh, literal and figurative meanings, basic and special meanings, denotation and connotation also means that denotation means literal meanings, basic meanings from the dictionary. Connotation means, you know, associations, means some words, they can have positive or negative associations, right? So, uh, uh, they, of course, need to be, you know, studied. Uh, I mean, writers, you know, they have, when they choose words, they have to ask themselves the question that uh, whether uh, there is any uh, negative, uh, you know, uh, connotation or negative association of uh, people of that very community, you know, he's writing uh, to or writing for, so he should avoid those words. Some examples of denotation and connotation for you. Like, for some people, the word pig might have connotations of dirty and smelly. Others will think of inquisitive or cheeky. Another interesting example, you know, this owl, the, the bird owl. In this part of the world, we call, I mean, owl has negative connotation, I mean, bad connotation. We call owls means, you know, people who are foolish, for example. But in Europe, it has a very positive connotation. You know, over there, owl is a symbol of uh, you know, sagacity, symbol of, uh, you know, wiseness and all. So, uh, quite opposite in uh, their, like, you know, meanings. Some more examples uh, I would like to share with you, that if you call someone lazy, you know, lazy has a negative connotation, relaxed is a positive connotation, whereas the meanings are same. Lazy, negative, relaxed, positive, meanings are same. So, choose yourself, which one is the better, of course, the one which has positive connotation. And then, Cowardly, its positive is prudent. Out of date is time tested. Nobody wants to be called as out of date. Yeah, if you call someone's talk as time tested, he would say, oh, wow, yeah, that's a nice compliment. And uh, some more, stiff necked, dignified. Meanings are absolutely thousand and one same, but their connotations are different. Look at the word stiff necked, very negative connotation, stiff necked. Sorry to say, as people also call it, you know, piggy neck. The one like, you know, who does not see left or right, he's so arrogant. Another very positive word of the same, conveying the same meanings is, you know, uh, prudent. Then comes, you know, stubborn and uh, persevering and miserly as uh, thrifty. So this is what actually we call uh, connotations and denotations. Dear students, uh, today we talked about uh, words, how words are structured, how words are formed, and how words are in relationship with other words and how words are associated uh, with respect to their meanings. I hope you liked my this, today's discussion. See you next time. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye.